Hello there, um, and thank you for joining us at this webinar to discuss the JOS annual poverty report. My name is Jason Beatty. I'm a assistant editor of, editor of the Daily Mirror, and I cover everything from politics to campaigns, including campaigns on poverty. Um, I'll introduce our panel of speakers in a moment. Uh, but the first thing I want to say is that the sheer number of you attending, I think I've just been told this is the largest ever attendance for a JRF webinar, is a testament to the seriousness of a problem, but it's also a testament to how seriously people take it. Uh, the other thing I'd kind of like to note is there will be a plurality of views today on the best way to address the problem. Um, but we want things to change. There cannot be a monopoly on compassion. Everyone here today shares the common goal in wanting to end the blight of deprivation and to make a positive difference to people's lives. And I really hope that spirit of positivity would shape today's discussions. Um, and finally, we're gonna hear a lot of statistics today. And I think we should all bear in mind that behind each number is a person with different circumstances, opportunities, expectations and conditions. So there's a lot to discuss, the impact of the pandemic on poverty, the cost of living crisis with rising inflation, rising fuel and food bills, whether the pathway to work is the best way of bringing people out, of lifting people out of poverty, will it work for those in deep poverty? The fact that the, there's great geographical um, differences and levels of poverty. Um, but the Bangladeshi, Pakistani, and Black communities have higher rates of poverty, but more women than men are in poverty, that nearly a third of disabled people are in poverty. And then there's a broader issues of the link between health and poverty. I, I call to mind Chris Whitty last year, talking about people on the borderlines of deprivation were facing hardship, and that would have, quotes, a massive impact on health services in the future. And then, of course, there's the link between education and poverty, will leveling up make a difference? So, so the, as I say, there's, there's, there's plenty here. Um, I'll, I'll be, stop talking in a minute. Um, the format is as follows. You're gonna hear from each of our four speakers. They are under strict instructions, which I will rigorously enforce, that they are not to speak for more than 10 minutes. And then there'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions using the chat function. Um, and as you all realize, there's quite a lot going on today. Um, so we are going to finish um, on the dot at midday. We cannot overrun, I'm afraid. Um, just finally, there is a Ask the Analyst JRF, JRF Twitter session on Friday. You should be emailed details this as well but it runs between midday and 1 p.m. on Friday, and you can get them by following them on Twitter at, at JRF underscore UK. Um, so without further ado, let's meet our four speakers. Um, we're gonna start with uh, Peter Matejic, who from the JRF, he's the Deputy Director of Evidence Impact, the Joseph Roundy Foundation. He's one of the co-authors of the report. He's um, uh, gonna, gonna run through the main findings of the report and kind of set the scene for the following discussions. Here, here be followed by Mel Locke. Uh, Mel is a co-founder of the Grassroots Poverty Action Group. She's gonna talk about her own experience of poverty, the difficulties of navigating her way out of poverty, and we'll bring a human perspective to, uh, to, to to bear on the discussions. Mel also contributed to, to the report. Um, we're delighted to have her with us. Um, following that, we'll have Baroness Philippa Stroud. Thank you for joining us, Philippa. Uh, Philippa is the CEO of the Legatum Institute Think Tank. She's the co-founder of the Center for uh, Policy Studies. Uh, sorry, I've got that wrong. The Center for, for Social Justice. Uh, a former advisor to Ian Duncan Smith, and has a long history um, of looking at areas of rehabilitation and deprivation. Um, and she should bring a very interesting perspective to this. Um, and, and finally, we'll hear from 
Jonathan Ashworth. Uh, Jonathan Ashworth is the shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions. Before that, he was the Shadow Health Secretary for many, many years, Jonathan, um, and deserves a, a, a long medal for long service for that one. Um, now Jonathan is going to bring, bring a really interesting kind of perspective on, on the link, I hope, between, kind of, between health and poverty, because he's got his areas of expertise. But he's also spoken personally in an interview with Mira, I just happy to plug, of his own experience of growing up in poverty, and he told about how it humiliates and haunts you for the rest of your life. So without further ado, um, I will hand over to Peter. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I'm just going to uh, spend a moment just getting the slides up, so if you bear with me. Cool. So I'm hoping everybody can see um, the slides okay. If, uh, if anybody can't, um, do let me know. And if you can't hear me, do let me know as well. Um, but yeah, so what I'm going to do is give you a run through, a very quick run through of our report. And hopefully you'll also be able to look at the report as well when we send through the, this presentation. Um, so yeah, so I'm going to start with just um, sort of why have we changed our, our report for this year. Then I'm going to go on to an overview about poverty in the UK. And basically my, my free word summary is kind of deepening for many. I'm going to talk a bit about future prospects, including the effects of changes in work, benefits and housing, and then talk a bit about the experience of being in poverty, but I'm, I'm sure Mel will also cover that. But I think it is going to be, it's, what we've heard is it's going to be a constant struggle. And then conclude with a little bit about um, what needs to happen. So just to come on to sort of what has changed in this year's UK Poverty Report. So we've um, done a lot of thinking about well, what what do we need to, to, to put in, in place and Alex my colleague has put a medium blog out on this but we're trying to do an overview of all aspects of poverty look at sort of causation what are the kind of key drivers we're also going to plan to do this every year and be consistent over time so we can look at trends we want to look across a range of data sources so that we get really behind the detail we want to make the, the data and analysis available. So hopefully by the end of this week, the, the data behind all the charts you'll see will be available on our website. We want to hear the voices of people with lived experience. And we also want to sort of make a judgment on progress. And I think that's always going to be kind of a balanced judgment. Just there'll be positives and negatives and we'll try and weigh those up. So I'm going to just go through some of the key statistics. So basically um, what we see, and we're using a definition of poverty of um, being below 60% of median income adjusted for family size and composition, and that's sort of the standard international and national definition after housing costs. So we see 22 in every 100 people were in poverty. That's been sort of broadly flat over the last 10 years, if anything, going up slightly, but the trends in some of the kind of subgroups of that have been much more dramatic, and I'll come on to some of those. Um, so the first subgroup I wanted to talk about was disability. So um, 27 in every 100 people in a family companion disabled person is in poverty. And that is after we, we count the disability benefits of paying the extra cost of disability as income, as that's consistent with, with how the official statistics are measuring it. But in theory, those benefits are actually paying for extra costs due to the disability. And if you take those that income out, it's more like a third of people in families containing a disabled person are in poverty and as you can see that's a gap with the kind of overall so it does mean that you're more likely to be in poverty if you're in a family containing someone who's got a disability. Children, 31 in every 100 children were in poverty. Now this has increased since 2011-12 by 3.7 percentage points so it was closer to 2027 20, um, about 10 years ago. Now this 3.7 percentage points may not sound a lot but it actually equates to 700,000 more children in poverty. And we're currently at 4.3 million children in poverty. And our statistics yesterday suggested that 1.8 million of these are in deep poverty, which means their income is totally inadequate. And also we see a quarter of children in poverty are food insecure. So that means that there's worries from, from their family about putting food on the table. Um, and what, we're, what, what we are worried therefore by is the fact that this means that child poverty is growing and deepening at the same time. So it's a really kind of worrying trend that, that we're, we're monitoring. Um, what's driving some of those increases? Well, we think there's, there's, there's direct sort of 
causation from some of the policies that, 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 are, that are happening at the moment. So 47 in every 100 children with a family with more than three children are in poverty. Now that was down to 33% in 2012, 13. And so it's risen dramatically and is now back to its level around when it was sort of in 1996, 97. So it's been a kind of V-shaped um, sort of trend over time. Um, and we fear that this is going to increase further. Um, these families have a higher proportion of their incomes made up by benefits, even though employment rates for such families have incro increased in recent years. So they're disproportionately affected by general changes in the benefit systems plus things like the benefit cap will disproportionately affect them. And we've also got the two child limit where benefits are only paid for the first two children in a family. Now this is only, only comes into place for children born after April 2017. So lots of the families that were surveyed in this survey weren't, aren't, haven't been affected by that yet. Um, but that's every year that's going to grow in number um, as, as, as you know, more children are born. So, um, yeah, this is a trend that we'll really be worried about and, and, and monitoring going forward. Um, as Jason says, um, ethnicity has got, a, ethnic minorities have got much higher poverty rates than, than the general population. So um, almost half of Pakistani uh, families that are in poverty. And when we come on to Bangladeshi families, you'll see the majority of the, the icons are red, meaning the majority of Pakistani and Bangladeshi families are in poverty. And this is despite 25 years of improvement for these groups. And um, so in the mid 1990s, two out of three people in households headed by someone of Pakistani, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistani ethnicity and over eight in 10 people in households headed by someone of Bangladeshi ethnicity were in poverty. So this is a trend that's improved, but still has a, has a, has a long way to go to, to, you know, to be at a, at a you know, more average level. Um, so then coming on to the geographical picture, so one of the things that I think everybody's noticed during the pandemic has been variations in responses between countries of the UK and with a far greater visibility of leaders in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. We also see that the benefits system in Scotland and Northern Ireland are increasingly different from each other and from the rest of the UK, with mitigations against some of the most poverty increasing welfare reforms of the last decade. And for Scotland, a new, child, a new Scottish child payment, which will be doubled from April 2020, and will help to make progress towards its Child Poverty Act. While our modelling suggests that more action is needed to reach that target, it's noteworthy to see that those two countries, Northern Ireland and Scotland, are the countries with the lowest poverty rates. Um, in terms of areas of England with higher poverty rates, the highest rates are in London, where we think it's due to the tenure mix and high, high cost of housing. And then all the higher rates are in North East, West Midlands and Yorkshire and the Humber, where we don't think that's down to high housing costs. It's more due to the economics of those areas. Um, higher rates of worklessness and sort of more low paid jobs. Now, some of you will have hopefully dialed into the last year's webinar where you'll have seen some of the preceding slides for the previous year's data. Unfortunately, the main edit I've had to make those slides is to colour more of the icons in red, which shows that if anything, um, it's a slightly worse picture than the previous year. But what about that? But one of the things about the data is it ends just before the pandemic starts. So what do we think the pandemic will have done to poverty and hopefully beyond the pandemic, what's the kind of future picture? So it's complicated, it's sort of, um, uh, as always with statistics. Um, so to, to an extent, the picture is unclear. We don't have official poverty data yet. Uh, and we know that the surveys we rely on will be affected by the pandemic as much as everything else. Um, but we think it's kind of a mixed picture. So there were some big interventions by the government during the pandemic. Um, so you'll see the, the green icon for the £20 uplift to universal credit. And even beyond that, there's been increases for working families from November in, in the budget then. And basically, there has been some protections. The furlough scheme really did work to, to keep a cap on um, unemployment rises. Um, but we're really worried about the future prospects. So if anything, you know, the inflation rate that we've heard this morning is really worrying. And I'll come on to some of the impacts of that. Um, but yes, you'll, you'll see that sort of um, inflation this morning was 5.4%, and that's the highest rate since 1992. And earnings and benefits are not rising anything more, anything um, like as fast. So benefits are going to go up by 3.1% in April. So they're not going to change until April, and they've only got by 3.1%, much lower than the rate of inflation. And we heard yesterday that earnings were rising at less than 4% when inflation is about 5.5%. So again, worrying for the future prospects for poverty. 
So just going to more detail. So they're sort of increasing in work poverty. So this is a chart showing uh, sort of poverty rates by um, sort of work status. And you'll see that the, 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 the three sort of middle bars of couple one full-time work, one part-time work, one full-time not working and part-time work only all have increased. And it used to be the case that around half of families in poverty um, had somebody in work. And at the moment, it's about two thirds of families in poverty have someone at work. Um, and over the last 15 years, all regions have seen increases in the poverty rates of working age adults in households where someone works. And um, so that's what that's that's sort of a very concerning picture. I suppose the other side of, of the coin is that over that period, employment rates have grown dramatically as well. So there are more families that are uh, in work. And so that is, again, still a positive effect. So you'll see that the, the no one in work is still much higher than the poverty rates for all the other groups. And that's the group that's been shrinking in number. So that, that, is, that is a good trend, but equally sort of rates of low pay, rates of kind of insecurity, rates of sort of part-time work aren't pe taking people out of poverty. In terms of what the benefit systems um, could do, so what we see here is basically um, the poverty rates of people on different types of benefits. And what we can see is basically the, the palest purple line is the longest line in each one of these cases. Um, so this means that basically um, you know, you're more likely to be in poverty if you're on benefits now than you were sort of 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Now, this is partly because of uh, benefit reforms where sort of the benefits have been targeted at those most at need. But equally, it does also follow a decade of, of cuts. And the next slide sort of talks, talks us through that. Um, so basically, and this is a slightly complicated chart, but if, um, if a benefit was keeping up with the rate of inflation, um, your purple and green lines would be basically following the blue line, so keeping at the kind of 100 value. And what we see, and this is during the period of the benefits freeze, and this is just due to the benefits freeze, not mentioning any other welfare reforms, basically benefits weren't keeping up with earnings, weren't keeping up with inflation, and so we see a kind of steady decline between 2016 and 2019 or so. You can see the dramatic effects of the increase due to the £20 a week uplift, um, but not all benefits saw that increase. So that takes it above the line for a little period. But then obviously that was withdrawn for Octo from October and the increases in the budget were only for working families. So basically this means that the out of work benefit is at its lowest level since, 20, since 1991. So we've got inflation at the highest rate since, since the early 90s. And, ben and, the, and the basic rate of benefits at the lowest rate since the early 1990s. And the other worry is this is sort of relative to inflation. So since October, inflation has been increasing. So if anything, that will decrease the gradient of that purple line even further. In terms of poverty and accommodation, so um, being in poverty influences the size, quality and, and type of dwellings people are able to access. It can also result in instability where people are uncertain about sort of, you know, keeping a roof over their own heads at the, at the, at the worst of it. Um, so social renters have the highest poverty rate at around half. And this mainly reflects the low incomes of people in the social rented sector um, because social housing is often allocated on the, on the basis of need. In terms of private rents, we see that private rents actually weren't increasing in real terms between over the last decade. But there are more people in the private rented sector, um, which is more expensive than buying of a mortgage. So it is sort of driving up the poverty rates, but it's more a kind of compositional effect with more people in the private rented sector. And that's what's sort of pushing up poverty due to, to the private rent sector. And um, there are lots of people buying a mortgage or owned outright that are in poverty, um, but it's mainly not due to their housing costs, it's mainly due to low incomes, we'd say. And um, so that's sort of some of the kind of drive of the poverty. I wanted to talk a bit about the, the experience of, of, of being in poverty. Some of this we can capture, some of that we can't, um, some of it is quite subjective. So we've got a powerful GPAG and Grassroots Poverty Action Group blog company in this report talking about poverty stigma, which is really hard to measure, but is a real critical factor for people in poverty. And I'd urge you to read that. Um, but what we do see is basically that um, Households in households with lower incomes are spending more on some of the essentials. So um, some of the pur purpley bars at the bottom are food and non-alcoholic drinks, housing, water, and electricity. You'll see basically the poorer households spend more on those 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 items than richer households. Um, and basically, 
those are some of the items that are driving the 5.4% increase um, that we saw um, this morning. Um, and what we also see is basically that those households have less move room to manoeuvre, so that they're spending less anyway, and they're spending more on the essentials. So there's very little, in many cases, that can be cut back from, from their budgets. One of the things we're really very worried about is energy prices. So it's already sort of one of the key drivers of the rising inflation. But come April, um, the energy price cap is, is likely to rise and rise dramatically. And you can see that on this slide. And basically the purple bars are, are what it is now, or well, a, a year or so ago. And then the pale blue bars are sort of the increases over time. And particularly for some fam families with uh, singles with children or couples without children, it's about a quarter of their budget from April. But singles without children, if that, you know, with a low income, if we're talking about over half of their budget, which really is unsustainable, and we really do think that, that the government needs to, to mitigate that because it will really drive some people over the edge in terms of financial pressure. And it's not just sort of, a, you know, I think that's kind of a, an accumulation of kind of stress. So we can see here that working age adults in poverty are much more likely to report sort of being in less than good health. And we think part of the kind of narrowing of the gap at 65 plus is, is, is partly a really negative story about life expectancy of people in, in poorer areas being smaller than, 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 than life expectancy of people in richer areas. And some of the gap is basically people in richer areas living, living longer. So that gap is, you know, is, is stark for the working age lives and something that we're, we're really worried about. Um, in terms of other indicators, we see that even at the young age, there's a gap in educational attainment for young people by parental income level, and this continues through or throughout education. And we can also see that, um, that there's the areas with high proportions of the population experiencing low income deprivation are also areas of high proportions experiencing many other forms of deprivation, so employment, education, health, but also crime. So again that's sort of you know worrying and sort of the experience of being in poverty is something that's, that's critical to, to think about as well so what what do we need to, to happen so even before coronavirus millions of people in our society were living precarious and insecure lives and as i've shown quite a lot of that has been worsening over time and in since you know and, and that was before the pandemic and in many instances the pandemic itself will have swept them deeper into poverty as well as pulling others into hardship and I think there'll be lots of people who won't have experienced this before lots of people who've experienced it for some time but finding it a lot worse at the start of 2022 we're seeing waves of price increases in energy and council tax and housing costs in fuel and we're seeing high inflation and low benefit rates and I just think something needs to change and I think this quote from the grassroots poverty action group about the need for commitment effort and action on all of these issues and challenges to turn back the tide is this something that we really need you know everybody across society to take seriously and start to think about well, what can be done thanks everybody for, for, for joining in and i'll hand over to my panelists who i'm sure will be brilliant thank you everybody thank you peter uh, we'll now hand go over to, to mel who's going to talk about her experience of, of living in poverty Good morning, everybody. I have lived the shame and discrimination of being in persistent poverty now for nearly over 11 years. And participating in the grassroots poverty group for the last three of those years has helped me not only to face my own demons and the reality of my own struggles, but those within the group, often hearing hard, uncomfortable stories of what it's like to live in poverty and realizing the common predicaments we find ourselves in. The JRF project team have managed to form a trusting and open forum, which isn't an easy task when we've been meeting virtually now for the last two years. I'm so grateful for being allowed to participate in this project and for the kindness and support and opportunity to get our message heard. It's with a big thanks to Peter, Alex, Katie, Emma and Bronnie, just to name a few of the team and the participants of the group. For years, I've beaten myself up for taking wrong turns in life, and I finally realised that I'm not alone and that being in poverty isn't solely down to something I can control. 
Over the years, I've often heard the popular belief that the reason people are in poverty is due to their own laziness and that it's easier to be reliant on the social system than work your way out of it. This is an old fashioned stigma, which the poverty trap is so much harder to escape and no one wants to be brandished as a lazy and a drained society. For a number of years, I've wondered how I can manage the practicalities of working my way out of it, only if I could get more hours or more childcare. Poverty is not a choice, but often the result of personal crisis, which we have no control due to the complications of life, such as health issues, periods of trauma, lack of understanding and ability to navigate the current benefit system. Poverty can strike anyway, anyone, though some of us are more vulnerable than others, and once it pulls you in, it's hard to claw yourself back out. Most of us don't have the reserves to be more than a month or two away from being in poverty if our circumstances change. We're in poverty without a voice, having to choose between heat and food and food and clothing. My grandparents were proud to be a part of creating the state system to ensure that there was a level of protection for future generations so that we would not have to experience the pain and suffering of a Victorian Britain again like they did. I would therefore like to use this five minutes just to explain my own reality and some of the effects poverty has had on me and my son. From the age of 13, I was brought up to have a strong working ethic, delivering free local papers. It didn't pay well, but it gave me the realisation that if I wanted nice things in life, I had to earn it. I progressed my career whilst at school by working in Freeman Hardy and Willis as a Saturday girl at the age of 14 and subsequently worked in Waitrose. I continued to support myself throughout university, even though I was lucky enough to have a grant, it still didn't cover the cost of rent. I believe the short term hardship would all be worthwhile for the long term gain of living the life I wanted. I came out of university with over £10,000 of debt and four years less experience than my peers who were already working and starting out in the property market. From the age of 22, I attended night school whilst working full time to qualify in HR with the hope of finally finding my forever career. Up to the age of 33, I worked hard building a life, marrying the man who I thought was the man of my dreams. Yet whenever I felt I was getting nearer to the life I wanted, it seemed there was a force against me pushing it further away. The blow then came after two years of purchasing my home. My intuition had grown stronger and was now screaming at me. On the day I found out I was pregnant, I was also found my husband's gambling habit. It all made sense. And I finally understood the reason we weren't financially progressing. Just like a game of snakes and ladders, my security was pulled away from me and we're actually in a further 25,000 pounds worth of debt that I wasn't aware of. He had gambled everything. I believed we'd invested in our future and my dreams were shattered just like that. Feeling it was my duty as a wife, I spent the next two years to, trying to help him overcome his addiction, but soon came to the realization I was sailing the ship alone. I saw the path was leading only to a further destruction and there was no helping him. I held on to the belief that despite having an 18 month old son, at the time, that within a couple of years I could get back to work and be back on my feet as I had always been in the past, only this time as a single mother. What I hadn't accounted for was the impact of domestic abuse I had experienced on me mentally and how grueling the benefit system was, and that I would have no control now over my life. The systems in place help people when experiencing difficulties are not fit for purpose. They fail to provide the very safety net for those in hard times that they should. And you are continually made to feel like a criminal for trying to get your fitting back. I actually feel that the treatment I received made matters worse by causing further debt and more of a financial struggle. Despite the fact I'd raised all the capital for my property, I jointly owned it with my ex-husband. Once he left, by which time I had an 18 month old baby, I was unable to pay the mortgage alone. Not being in employment, Having made, been made redundant prior to giving birth, I was advised by the Citizens Advice Bureau that I had no choice but to let the property be repossessed. It was thought that this would take three to six months. However, I was left by the council for three years before I could get any housing help. Each time I thought I was getting a step closer, another barrier would be put in my way. Each time being told that despite having a young baby, you were not a priority. This sent my mental health into turmoil, knowing that any time I could be evicted from my home and sent to live in another location away from friends with no security, let alone each month being put into a further £1,200 worth of debt just in mortgage repayments. 
I would spend most of my days and nights crying, looking for a way out. I questioned my existence. I sold myself short on dating websites in the hope that someone would see the real me. I prayed I would meet my life partner to rebuild a life with, but I never did. My only saving grace was my son, although who knows what effect all this had on him. I knew my son depended on me to survive as my ex had stopped all contact when he was two. I tried getting work, but that work, I could, what work could I do with no childcare support other than three hours, three days a week of free childcare? I tried volunteering, but due to my vulnerable position was often taken advantage of, leaving my mental health worse than before I started. I needed money in advance of starting a job to pay for childcare, and this left me, <clears throat> left me in a catch-22 position. In the meantime, my ex continued getting me into more debt, not paying bills and getting CCJs against my name, which I could do nothing about. How? He would only periodically pay my son's maintenance and I would have yet another department or organisation to go into battle with. I even had the embarrassment and shame of my neighbours knowing that I was unable to pay my ground rent and maintenance. I became almost a recluse for fear of bumping into my neighbours. Eventually, I was repossessed and had no choice but to file for bankruptcy. Even this costed over £500 for the privilege, and yet having another judgment about me and my lifestyle. Again, even though I was advised this would be the best way of starting over, it didn't make my life any easier. When my son reached five in March 2014, having been continually pressured to find work, despite the fact my mental health was in tatters, I'd lost all confidence and self-belief in myself. I did manage to find a part-time role that would fit in with my lifestyle um, because I didn't have a car anymore because I could no longer afford the maintenance of running that car. I had to take public transport. However, taking this work meant a reduction in salary from my pre-child hourly pay. And I was now working. I lost my legal aid to help me through the divorce. This meant I had no recourse to the further financial abuse my ex was asserting over me, not committing to the agreements he had made. It would seem as soon as I would sort one problem out, I would experience another setback in another piece of my life. And this has just continued to happen, such as the introduction of universal credit in April 2016 and having to wait nine weeks for payment due to an error in the system and, and also losing three part time jobs within two years. Borrowing more and more to cover for food and rent during this period, never fully seeming to get the money back to the level where I was prior to the implementation and get back on top of my payments. Each time calling the job centre, having to pay premium rates, just many of one, sorry, just one of many examples of the premium poverty trap. This was then quickly followed by the change in child maintenance system overhaul in January 27 and my ex not fulfilling his payments. The support from the new and supposedly improved child maintenance service again has failed to live up to expectations. Its role in chasing back payments and making errors with no recourse and being told to borrow money to make up for the shortfall is yet another shameful system to penalise those most in need. Despite asking my local MP for help with this matter, I was told there was nothing that could be done about this system. I could spend at least 10 minutes talking about the idiosyncrasies that discriminate and how my ex can manipulate these systems in place to, favor, to his favour. How I, as I, as a sole parent by default, have to continually make up the shortfall of, by borrowing where there are no further funds available to me. As it currently stands, I'm owed nearly 2,500 in underpayments since August 2019 to 2020 by my ex. No payments have been reclaimed until this month, despite my many calls to Chase. I have only just been informed by the Child Maintenance Service they will collect the money at £28 a month to ensure my ex can afford, afford the payments. At this rate, it will take nearly nine years to repay the money back. And I was given no notice to find a shortfall of £400 a month when he stopped paying it. And I was left with no means to cover the shortfall. There is so much more I can tell you out of my experiences and that of the group of others in the grassroots poverty group, but I have overrun my allotted time slot. So in summary, during the most painful and stressful period of my life, when I thought I had the backing and support of the state, having been battered and bruised by domestic violence, I have had to accept the further abuse, not only from my ex, the courts, 
but the very systems and services in place set up to help the most vulnerable. A home is not a commodity, that home is a necessity, not a commodity. Yet in our society, property is a money spinner for wealthy investors. Landlords and property investors should not benefit from the most vulnerable and the poorest in society. 10 years ago, food banks were non-existent, yet now they are relied upon by many. The state needs to take a holistic approach, helping those in poverty to become mentally and well secure. To help those when most valuable ride the waves of the storm and have some form of control over their lives to make choices. We need to have an overhaul of the benefit system and create something not broken, demeaning and not judgmental. Thank you for your time. Mel, thank you very much for, for speaking with such candour about the difficulties you've faced and the unwieldy and impersonal system you've had to cope with over many years. I will now move on to, to, to Philippa. Uh, Philippa has spoken about the need for a new social contract and maybe she could explain how that envisaged that would work. Thank you. Jason, Jason, thank you. And um, just to start really also by just thanking JRF for, for this report as well. It's hugely timely in helping us um, understand exactly where we're at at this moment in time and the challenges of going forward. And um, I just want to say to Mel as well, um, thank you so much for that. Um, if, if ever we naively thought uh, poverty was not a complicated matter, with many different factors to it. I think your personal testimony has shown us just how many different factors compounded together. Um, and uh, we're just hugely grateful for your courage in coming to share this morning um, and also of your input into bringing your experience to help us understand this more, so, so thank you. Um, I want to take a moment, um, just before I go on to things like social contract, just to say what everyone on this call uh, probably already knows, but that we uh, sometimes uh, forget. And it just has to, I think, just be repeatedly stated that poverty in the UK remains a significant high um, and remains significantly high and at, at an unacceptable level. And um, I think if you're on this call, you know that, um, but I think it's really important that um, we don't just get used to statistics like 14 million people uh, living in poverty, but we actually realize that that is unacceptable in today's society, that overall rates of poverty have changed relatively little since the millennium. So if you actually look at the overall rate of poverty, it's gone up, it's bounced around between about 21% and 23% of the population. But that actually, um, if, you, if you think back uh, since, you know, the, since the millennium, governments of all colors have had serious attempts at throwing their particular philosophy at the issue of poverty. So if you, if you think um, of back to the uh, New Labour days um, and Gordon Brown's redistribution through the, through the tax and benefit system, there was huge redistribution going on um, and taking place. And yet we still had persistently high uh, poverty rates. If I think back to the coalition days uh, when, when we were in government and literally we threw everything at the make work pay uh, progression in work and uh, we came in at a time where unemployment was at eight percent and it halved during that time back down to four percent but still um, stubbornly resistant uh, poverty levels and in many ways um, when I when I'm when I'm standing in parliament and I'm listening to to the debates um, in many ways I think that our, our debates are often around the 200,000 people who might move one way or another, or at best about a million people who we, who we might see um, have their life trajectory uh, changed. But it's, it's not about substantively changing the structure of society to ensure that people, uh, that 14 million people in poverty are, um, are uh, they're, they're, they're able to build lives and thrive within the UK. And um, I think as Peter was hinting at at the end of his, 
presentation, this suggests that if we want a different outcome, we probably need a more holistic and better understanding um, approach to, to, this, to this challenge. Um, but I just want to focus in too on the kind of last two years journey because it's been complicated. It's been complicated with the pandemic and, and it's been complicated getting proper data on what's actually uh, been happening. And um, Peter mentioned in his presentation that um, in 2019, the year prior to the pandemic, poverty in the UK had in fact been falling by about, it's about 400,000 for those in poverty um, and then 200,000 for those in, in deep poverty. But because when that data was published, we were bang in the middle of a pandemic, we, it, it seemed so totally irrelevant and poverty levels were, were rising so quickly that we didn't actually stop to even acknowledge or even identify what had been driving that, that, um, that uh, uh, reduction in poverty. And it was more people in work, higher average earnings and falling housing costs. And um, it's just really interesting to try and flush that out. And at the same time, you know, financial distress was beginning to um, uh, decline slightly. Worklessness, mental and physical ill health were also just beginning to tip down. But as I've said, poverty rates remained high for many families, including particularly black and Asian families, disabled people and families with uh, large, large families, families with more children. We then see the impact of the pandemic. And we all know that COVID-19 not just had a financial impact, but had a huge impact on mental health resilience, the educational um, opportunities for, for our, our children. And um, in quarter two of 2021, we published some statistics which were now casting. We tried to take, take um, we tried to transpose forward the, um, the, the data. Um, and we see that 900,000 more people were in poverty than the pre-pandemic headline. Um, which is already a dramatic increase, but that was after uh, the universal credit uplift that had protected a further 800,000 people and poverty would have been even higher without the furlough and business support. Um, so we then published another now, now casting uh, report just before Christmas, and this was published just before Plan B was announced. And um, our work suggested at that point in time driven by significant strengthening of the labour market, that poverty had the opportunity to have returned to the 2019 levels. Obviously not saying the 2019 levels were good, um, still talking about a, an unacceptably large number of people in poverty, but we had the opportunity at that point in time to, to return to those levels. Um, but I think when we when we look at that at that journey, one of the things that we have to understand is that small changes have a huge impact on vulnerable lives. So what might seem like a small change when you're sitting in the treasury actually is a colossal change on individuals um, bank balances and on their lives and even something like plan B which was, um, you know, the government thought was a, a small change to, to the restrictions. It was like the, the minimum that they felt could happen. That that decision um, that had the, the potential of damaging the labor, labor market, damaging the most vulnerable and damaging the, the least resilient. So some of that bounce back that could have happened for the most vulnerable through the labor market uh, was less likely to happen. Uh, so, and small market changes or government action that many can withstand, those on low wages can't, or conversely, where there are positive changes, small changes, they can make a hugely positive difference as well. And um, we have to understand that, and we have to understand that our actions have consequences and, take, and to take care. So just looking forward now where we are at in the landscape, well, obviously we know that the removal of the 20 pound uplift for those with no work expectations, so obviously we, we've seen a restoration, we've seen, we've seen the um, uh, reduction of the taper rate to 55%, we've seen the increase in work allowances, but the people that that's left exposed have been those for whom we have no work expectations, so those with, with disabilities, those with young children. We've seen 
rising inflation, as Peter has drawn attention to. We've seen rising energy costs, the increase in national insurance contributions. And when, again, you're sitting in the Treasury um, or you're, you're in the city, those might look like small changes, but combined, they have a potential for seriously damaging uh, those who are on low incomes. But today is about the essential guide to understanding poverty. So I want to um, just close out um, my remarks really um, with my understanding of how we could potentially move forward and where we need increased understanding. Um, as Jason mentioned, um, we need a, a fresh understanding of what moves the dial um, and, uh, and what the levers are at our disposal. Sorry, I'm just getting something off my screen. Um, we need a new social contract. What can the British public expect if they get into difficulty from the state? We need to understand that no one group of people has the answers. So we need to work together as Jason and Peter alluded to. There are some things that only government can do. So we need a clear spelling out of what our social contract is with those who are um, unemployed, those with, who have sicknesses and those with disabilities and those who, who cannot work. It is unacceptable that people who cannot work are consigned to um, a life of poverty. There are some things that employers need to take responsibility for. If I am, I am an employer, do I know if any of my staff are in poverty? And do I know what I can do about it? How can I be a poverty-free employer? I think that's a question that we need to raise in our society. There are some things that my community is crucial for, walking with me if I'm in poverty on a, uh, walking with me if I'm in poverty um, uh, and supporting me through that process is hugely important, actually a community coming around someone to support them. And then if I am in poverty, as we've heard from Melanie, there are things that she can do and is responsible for, but, she, but her, her um, attempts have got to be rewarded. And she's got to know that if she takes action, she can come out the other side. So in summary, if today is about the essential guide to understanding poverty, it starts with that assessment of progress to date. Um, I think Peter called it making a judgment of progress. Uh, we need to assess what's right with our approach, what's wrong, what's confused, what's missing. There are 14 million people in poverty and have been for a long time. We argue over the 2%, the 21% to 3%. We should be really honest with ourselves that we have been operating with a one lever model only, pretty much only what can government can do? How do we activate all the other levers, the business leader, the community lever, so that we can build a society that we all want to live in, no matter where you're from, who you are, what your background is, this is an enabling environment for people to thrive. Thank you very much, Philippa. I'm very conscious of time, so I'm gonna move straight on to, to, to Jonathan, thank you. Um, thank you, Jason. And can I start by saying it's an immense honour and privilege to be given this opportunity at the uh, uh, at the, uh, the Roundtree Foundation to, to make some remarks. I think this is my first um, uh, public platform outside of Parliament uh, that I've spoken at in my capacity as the work and Shadow Work and Pensions Secretary. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be given this chance. And it was a great honour uh, to be on this platform, this digital platform, Zoom platform, uh, and listen to Mel's powerful presentation and eloquent presentation and it is a reminder for me that the whole point of the welfare state when it was created was to take the shame out of need and to support people to pursue work and employment where the assumption was that work and employment would be able to provide you with a decent standard of living for you to be able to uh, run your home, run your life, support your family, and so on. And that has fundamentally broken down. There is that shame of poverty is not only still there, it is reinforced by a system that treats people with no dignity. And I've seen that myself as a constituency MP when I have to battle with unsympathetic bu bureaucracies to get people 
their uh, uh, just uh, their, their just deserves their, their settlements in which they are duly entitled. And of course, I know from my own personal experience growing up of the deep humiliation of poverty and how it haunts you for the rest of your life. So when I come at this issue, I come at it with a passion and a zeal and a commitment to tackle the shame of poverty, not born out of um, theories or, or textbooks, but out of the real lived experience that I, I endured as a child, but also the lived experience of many of my constituents in Leicester South, where we have one of the highest child poverty rates uh, uh, in, in the country. Uh, and of course, what I want to do as a potential work and pension secretary is build a system that alleviates and prevents poverty and provides people with the well-paid jobs uh, uh, that they deserve. And I always say this, I, I I'm a, have nothing but immense admiration for those who work at food banks and those who donate to food banks, who volunteer day in, day out at food banks. And I have helped create a food bank in my constituency, one of the most deprived parts of the constituency. But a test, a personal test for me as a, as a potential Secretary of State for Work and Pensions is not on how many food banks open, but on how many food banks shut. And that's what I want to see. I want to see food banks closing. I don't know if it's true or if it's just one of these things that goes around on Twitter, but people say there's more food banks than McDonald's. I don't know if that's true or if it's just a sort of urban myth. But a test of my uh, how, how successful I'd be would be was that we close food banks, not because we don't have nothing but admiration for those who work there, because we fundamentally tackle the demand so there isn't the need for people to really have to pick up food parcels on the way home from a shift. But the problem we have at the moment, and Melanie actually hit the nail on the head, is that people are in work doing, if you like, what they are told to have done by all the politicians, doing the right thing that politicians tell them to do, and yet are still in persistent poverty because of the way in which the labour market works, which is increasingly characterised by uh, low pay, uh, temporary work, and so on. And I think poverty is a, not only is it a criminal waste of the talents of the individual, and not only is it a shame that we should, which we are all motivated to do something about, I actually think it's not in our economic interests as a society either. Societies with higher levels of poverty are, are weaker economies, and there will be no levelling up There'll be no uh, uh, increases in productivity. There'll be no rebalancing of the economy unless persistent poverty and, and, and the other issues that we've been talking about here today are, are, are fundamentally tackled in a strategic way, which is why a big child poverty strategy is something that I would very much want to pursue if I was in uh, a government. And I think, and I think there's two questions for two issues for us. There's this, what is these long-term reforms, but also what are we going to do in the here and now? because we know that inflation, which is now at the highest level for 30 years, is going to exploit uh, and exacerbate these problems uh, with poverty. And we are a generation of politicians, frankly, and a, and, and a generation of policy makers who've never actually operated, really, in an environment of high inflation, uh, really. Uh, I mean, maybe some of us were around uh, in, uh, in public policy roles in 1989, 1990, 1991, etc. But generally speaking, we are a generation who've never operated in this environment. And, and I think that inflation is going to become one of the big political issues uh, of this year once we get over <laughs> parties and goodness knows what. I think that's going on down here in Westminster today. I think inflation is going to become one of the big political issues because what you're seeing now, what we saw yesterday with statistics, you're seeing wage growth stagnating and today uh, uh, prices uh, uh, rising. And that means that come this April, unless they make different decisions on indexation, and I think there are things that could be explored on that, but, un but unless dif a different decision is quickly made on indexation this April, uh, those on, uh, on benefits, including uh, pensioners, are going to face a 3% real terms cut. And I should just say, we, we always focus on, or we put a lot of focus on child poverty in these discussions quite rightly, but we are beginning to see again, uh, pensioner poverty uh, um, uh, uh, beginning to increase as well. So I think so. I think we've got to ask questions about what we can do in the here and now to deal with this these these problems with the cost of living. And then there's a, there's the longer term piece about fundamental uh, uh, reform. On the fundamental reform bit, I think we have, as I say, we have no option but to confront this. Not simply because it's as I say, poverty is a shameful 
uh, uh, disgrace, but also because if the, if the pandemic has shown us anything, it's that we have less resilience as a society when we have these wide, we, we, when we have this these levels of income inequality uh, um, uh, and poverty in society. Look at how look at what happened in the pandemic. It was those in lower paid jobs who had to go to work, who didn't have the luxury of uh, sitting on laptops, joining Zoom calls at home, who were worst hit in the pandemic, who in often, often in particular circumstances uh, were more likely to be admitted to hospital and uh, more likely uh, uh, to die in certain, in certain circumstances in the pandemic. And when you look at the areas now, also where there is persistent poverty, in a city, London, for example, and some of the some of the um, communities that you've you've highlighted in your report, these are also areas where vaccination rates are way below the national averages and where they should be. So the pandemic exploited uh, and thrived on inequality and poverty, and it was a it is a reminder of the deep links between poverty and health, because we talk about social injustice. Surely there can be no greater social injustice. That if you are born into poverty and deprivation, you are more likely to become ill sooner in life and die at an earlier age in life. And what that means in the starkest of terms is that is that a baby born right this second in my Leicester constituency or uh, here in I'm sorry, Westminster, here in parts of inner city London or in Glasgow, in Manchester and so on, these areas of high levels of poverty, that baby born right now is likely to live on average 10 years less than the baby born right now in, uh, in, in Surrey. And that child, as, as, as she grows up through her life, if she's in poverty, she is less likely, or would have been less likely to have, to have got the various different vaccinations and immunizations that you get as a child, more likely to be admitted to hospital throughout their childhood, usually for, some, usually for the problems to do with um, uh, dental problems usually, uh, less likely to develop um, speech and language well, again, usually because of problems to do with uh, oral, oral health, um, more likely as a teenager to need the support of mental health services, more likely to leave school obese. If the baby is very, very ill uh, when she's born, if she's in poverty, she's less likely to survive. I mean, these are fundamental injustices which are linked to poverty and deprivation. And just as that child throughout their life is, is uh, or growing up is going to have worse health outcomes through poverty, throughout the rest of their life, they're going to have worse health, health outcomes as well. Those in poverty are more likely to develop hypertension, heart disease, more likely to suffer stroke, more likely to, to, to develop and suffer certain cancers which are, which are connected uh, to lifestyles, more likely to need uh, mental health support, more likely to be prescribed uh, uh, antidepressants. When they get into their 50s, uh, they are more likely to be forced out of the labour market because they're not able to work, perhaps because they've had a stroke or because, perhaps because of serious heart conditions. And that in itself is, puts a problem on the household because it means somebody in that household is, is probably going to have to also come out of the labour market to care for them. So they'll, they'll need to get proper some form of carer's allowance or something to care for their, their partner uh, 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 who can no longer work. And one of the things which is very worrying, and, I, and, and I'm, I've not fully drilled down to it, but just looking at the, the, um, the, the employment data yesterday, actually employment, overall employment, is much below what it was pre-pandemic. And if you look into the data, there's 260,000 people who've come out of the labour market since the pandemic due to ill health or early retirement. I think those figures on ill health are going to worsen because you've already got waiting lists at 6 million. That's going to get work. Those waiting lists are going to get, get, get rocket, they're going to get higher and higher. Well, if you're waiting for a heart valve, you're waiting for uh, a, a knee replacement or someone, there's a lot of people are going to be forced out of the labor market as well, which is going to create, which is going to mean Jonathan, more poverty. Jonathan, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> Have you got 30 seconds? <laughs> so. Just to finish, because I can ten, I can, I can hear. Yes. So just to finish, look, poverty should come with a health warning, uh, uh, and 
dealing with poverty and the injustice of poverty is for me an ab- is for me my absolute uh, priority and i look forward to working very closely um with all the people on this call and many of the organizations who i know uh, are watching us this afternoon thank you very much indeed i i'm my apologies to everyone but we've run out of time for questions we we would try and answer some by by email but don't forget on friday we've got hashtag ask an analyst on the jof twitter feed between 12 and 1 i just want to give my thanks to to, to peter for putting the humanity behind the statistics to, to mel for speaking with great dignity about the indignity of the benefit system uh, for philippa for for offering a kind of wide-ranging viewpoint on, on all aspects of poverty and pointing out the, the disconnect sometimes between the, 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 the those in Whitehall and those on the ground. And finally, to, to Jonathan for, for his speaking with such passion and zeal, to use his words, about the need for fundamental reform and tackling fundamental injustice. And finally, thanks to the JOF for hosting this and for you for attending. Thank you very much indeed.